Uh, Teo, you want to go ahead and start up the uh, the presentation. Uh, I'm Rich Morris, and uh, Teo Hartman's with me today. And just I'm going to give you a little background stuff, but then Teo is going to give you the the meat of what uh, we've learned the last uh, six years now. It is so. Uh, we started uh, Broodminder about six years ago, and I met up with some uh, what turned out to be very good friends on the internet. And uh, yeah. okay, I've been keeping bees about 15 years, and Teo's been keeping bees about 10 years. And uh, we got into this mainly because you know I'm a, a farm boy and a a beekeeper and a engineer, and Taylor's also got an engineering, and we just think that we could do better than what we've been doing the last 150 years. So, you know, one thing we know for sure is that, you know, if you go in and inspect your hive uh, for, you know, if you minutes every two weeks, 99 point, you know, what's going on inside the beehive uh, is invisible to you. So. We just uh, talk a little bit about what we're missing. Go ahead, Tao. Um, so, you know, what's happening to your bee colony between inspections? Go ahead. Uh, is this a new presentation, Tao? It looks like yeah. the old one. I'm sorry. No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, just go ahead and do this whole slide, please. So, you know, there's a lot of things going on in your beehive, you know, the queen, uh, what's going on with her, the colony size, whoops. Okay, now he's going crazy. <laughs> yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, we'll get the hang of this. Uh, hold on just a second. You know, what sort of food stores, what pests are present, uh, attacked by bears, as uh, Randy was saying, and those sorts of things, and, and how much honey is there? Okay, go ahead. So one thing we do know is that bees don't like to be inspected. Uh, if we didn't need to know what was going on in there, we wouldn't inspect them and everybody would be happy. But we also know that without the inspections, there's more unknowns to us as beekeepers and that that's you know, just at, uh, looking for more risk. Go ahead and fail. So in a good beehive, we see something like this. So let me tell you what we're seeing here is a hive that, the best hive I've ever had this summer. And the chart at the top is weight and it's going from zero to 300 pounds. The dates are going from May through January, just a few days ago. And then on the bottom chart is temperature. And basically what we're seeing there is that they got going with their brood in a couple of weeks and just held the brood temperature at 95 degrees uh, through September when they started to brood down. We see that. So when we're looking at this data, you know, ideal behavior is pretty simple to look at. You know, I think anybody can look at this and say, oh, yeah, we're going up. That's great. Temperature is stable. That means they're brooding. You know, so this is what we wish we would see. And if we saw this in every hive, we wouldn't bother with anyone. Go ahead, Teo. So the question is with monitoring, what can you see? And the things we see are brood rearing because we know that bees thermoregulate when they're raising brood. So it's around 92 to 98 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we see queen, queen issues and Teo's got some examples of that he's gonna show. Uh, we see swarming. We see a, a temperature pulse uh, when they swarm, and that's really fascinating. Theo is also going to show you some examples of that. Uh, colony size. You know, since they're a little heater, then if you look at the difference between ambient temperature outside and the high temperature inside, then you're going to have a, an estimate of population, how strong that hive is. Uh, robbing. You know, any time that they get uh, uh, stressed, they'll lose thermal regulation. And if you're watching closely, you'll see that outside intruders, you know, if the hive gets knocked over, you see weight changes, of course. Uh, we see response to medication. So as we're treating our bees, then we also see the cluster temperature change. And then, of course, the easy one is the absolute hive weight will show you how much, uh, how many stores they have and those sorts of things. Go ahead. 
So the way we've set it up um, over the last few years uh, with the Broodminder is basically in the lower brood box, we'll put a temperature detector, mainly because it's cheap and simple and tells us really valuable information. In the upper brood box, we'll put a temperature and humidity detector. Uh, we'll talk about humidity a bit more, but uh, it's not nearly as indicative as temperature. And then under the scale, we put a weight sensor. Under the height, we put a weight sensor. And just off the left there, you can see, you know, over the last six years, we've made a bunch of doodads basically to connect all these things together. Uh, because we've got the sensors, but then we have to get those hoisted to the cloud or into your phone to be able to look at that data. The sensors themselves store data for um, uh, up to a year, you know, and you change have to change the batteries once a year or so. Um, but then you go and you can read those sensors with your phone or we have cell connections and those sorts of things. Um, go ahead, Tao. I'm sort of going through this quickly because this isn't the interesting stuff. Theo has got the interesting stuff. <laughs> but, you know, as an example, you know, you have a bunch of hives out there and you want to collect all this data. Uh, if you have one hive and, you know, a temperature sensor, that's pretty simple. But, you know, all of us have multiple, multiple apiaries, multiple hives. You know, a typical apiary, you know, even in someone's backyard, they got three to five hives and you got a few sensors and it gets to be real cumbersome. So a lot of what we've been doing this last six years is just getting methods uh, simple enough that my mom can use them to get that data up to where it's usable for us as beekeepers. Go ahead, Dale. Um, then, you know, just a little final word before letting Tao talk. Uh, so we've got those other things and we're also working on some pretty cool new things. Um, we're on the second generation of pretty much all of our devices because you do it one time and then immediately you say, I wish I had done it this way instead. So we did them again. Um, now our temperature sensors are detecting swarms and taking one minute data and things like that. Uh, we've been through a new generation of our app on the phone. Uh, we this year introduced uh, DIY parts because a lot of beekeepers out there, they want to build these things themselves. And, you know, they're good with screwdrivers and let's, not so good with uh, writing software. So uh, we make our circuit boards and uh, software available so that people can do that themselves. Uh, just this uh, winter, we added uh, LoRa support. LoRa is long range wireless. Uh, it's real popular in Europe and Australia, and it basically doesn't use much power, but it can transmit data um, like a, a mile. So when you have widely spaced beehives, that gets to be a real problem if you need to have uh, receivers within 20 or 30 feet. Uh, you can put these widely spaced and still collect the data and it comes up automatically into uh, Broodminder using these third-party devices. So we don't have to build everything, but we still support it. The cool things we're doing this year is uh, Herb Amon entered, has been playing around with uh, a B radar for the last couple of years. And so it was interesting, but it sort of finally got to the point where Herb was showing some really interesting data. He also uh, put an acoustic sensor on the box and not looking as much at the frequency analysis uh, like uh, was done in days past, but you know, just sort of an, a, a loudness of the box. And with those two things, watching the entrance activity and the box, uh, we'll see some interesting things. Uh, the main uh, nice part about it for us is we can use the, a lot of the circuitry we already have, and it's relatively inexpensive compared to a lot of other bee counters. So uh, it's just, this is a, sort of for fun. But our other big project, we got funded by the National Science Foundation for a small business innovative research grant uh, to continue working on our mite detector, our mite counter. So we wanted to work on this for a long time. 
ran into uh, the problems that getting the discrimination we wanted is harder than we had hoped. So we applied for some grant and got uh, $250,000 to work on that with Purdue. And the outcome of that is that we hope that we end up with a real-time mic counter that we can put and have 24 seven so that we can actually see the mic growth through colonies, uh, be non-invasive, it'll be infrared based so that it doesn't uh, interfere with the, uh, with the bee, but with the uh, colony dynamics and whatnot. So we're gonna be working hard on that this uh, summer and actually getting some money to do it instead of a lot of the volunteer work that we've been doing. So we're excited about all that. So uh, just to say that, you know, we've got about six people on our team and um, all beekeepers and all enthusiastic and we're having a great time doing it. So with that, um, I'll take a breath and see if there's any questions, but uh, really we want to get into where Teo's giving some of his experience uh, with his 50 or so hives that he runs. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Take it over, Teo. All right. Thank you, Rich. Uh, my name is Theo Hartmann. I'm in uh, Chesterfield, Virginia. I'm originally from Switzerland. Came over to the US in 1989 for six months and I never made it back. I'm still here. I uh, have no intention of going back because, uh, you know, it's, it's fun to work here and, and to be part of a, of a very um, enthusiastic team. And I want to uh, show you a few things about uh, what I've learned with, with uh, brood minder equipment and hive monitoring. I've, I was part of, I'm part of this team since more or less the beginning. And uh, we've, we've really learned a lot. And like Rich said, with, um, with the, uh, the bee dart that's coming up, uh, we are putting something together and we don't really know, well, we know some of the things we're going to see, but we don't really know everything. And that's how we started uh, with, with the, the instrumentation. We didn't really know what to expect and, and we learned as we, as we went along. I'm going to show you a few examples of, uh, you know, some traditional things and, uh, and, and, and tell you what I've learned over the years. Like Rich said, um, we, we can see, you know, how uh, well, the, um, the brood is behaving in a hive, and if, if a hive is queen, uh, queen right or queen less. And in this example here, um, this was a hive that was split on April 5th, and the queen was removed at that time. So the hive was made queenless right at the beginning here of this chart. And we've seen this over and over that 21 days after you remove the queen, the temperature start to fall. Temperature start to fall off out of the this gray band, what we call the brood zone, and that is an indication that there is no more uh, uh, brood in the hive, and they are no longer thermoregulating. And when the queen is replaced and the new queen starts laying, you will you will see that the, the colony comes back into thermoregulation. Uh, in this example, the queen was removed beginning of April. And the hive came back and was back online with, with brood around the middle of May. So it's, it's going to take six weeks plus minus uh, for a colony to, to raise a new queen. Now, there, is, there are some events that take place over, over such a process. When you, when you look at the whole, uh, at the whole picture here, and you, know, you can always, if you, if you are in beekeeping, you know that you always have to uh, use the, the bee math as some guide to find out what's going on in the hive and do some calculations to understand uh, in, in what uh, status the hive is and, and when, for example, a new queen could potentially be born when she's going to go on a mating flight and so on. And if I use this, this table here and overlay it into my chart, we had the 21 days from the beginning of the chart to about here. And now we have some events before the, the, the brood was uh, completely uh, vanished. And the first one was here on, on April 21st. 
where we have a, a temperature peak and when we look at this in a little bit of a, a, a closer uh, close up, we see that the temperature peak and at the same time, we see the weight drop um, of, the, of the hive and that is, uh, is indi indicative of a, of a swarm that took place. And if we, um, if we blow this up, uh, we see that uh, we lose around six, six, five and a half pounds in this hive and we have a temperature peak uh, the, the red line is the lower brood box and the yellow line is the upper brood box. We have a temperature peak in both brood boxes um, right at the time when the, the colony, when the swarm leaves, most of the, the bees leave the hive. And it's, it's interesting because uh, this temperature peak does not really happen. We see, saw this over and over. It doesn't really happen before, but it, it happens during the exodus when the bees actually leave the hive, that's when the, the temperature peaks. And if you zoom out and look at this a little bit from a distance, and that's always you know, the danger. If you have one peak and you look at it close up, you may not see uh, the, the forest from the trees and you always have to back out a little bit to really see what's going on. In this case, we saw something a couple of days prior to the swarm, there was there was a um, a weight. We have this valley that happens every day. When the bees leave in the morning, the weight drops and and the, the weight comes back in the afternoon. And here we had a mountain in the middle of the valley, which is not normal. And we we also had a temperature peak inside the hive. We had a temperature peak. This dark blue line. Is the, is the scale temperature. We had a temperature peak on the scale. We see this also uh, here at, the, at the, uh, the day of the swarm. We see some, some activity just prior to. And I went uh, and inspected this hive after the swarm. And I saw that there was a cluster of bees around the, 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 the scale, the hive scale that was in, in front of the hive. And, and so that caused some temperature excursion. And I go back here on the scale and it also caused a weight increase. So there was something going on that the bees uh, were trying to go into the hive, but they didn't find uh, the, the entrance. And I've seen this on a number of occasions, especially when you have screen bottom boards that um, a, a, a queen may go out on a, on a virgin may go out on a mating flight. She comes back and she doesn't find the entrance and may land on the, on the side of the hive on the screen bottom board. And I think here we had a case like this. Now, if we, um, <clears throat> there was the swarm and then we had a, a temperature event a few days later. And when you go back to the bee math uh, question, we, um, we, we, when I did the inspection on, on April 21st after the swarm, I found two virgins in this hive. Remember the hive was split, the queen was removed. Now we have queen cells in the hive and at some point uh, these queens, uh, the, the virgins will emerge. And, and this is, uh, is, is the, the reason why, uh, you know, the, some of the bees take off with the swarm. And also some, uh, at some point, the virgins will need to get mated. And so I found two virgins in the hive on April 21st. And then a few days later, um, I, I told the beekeepers uh, that the owner of the hive, it's not in my yard, it's somebody else's yard. I told them that the next event will be a, a, a mating flight. And, um, and sure enough, we saw, we saw this, um, we, we saw this uh, temperature peak a, a few days later. And now I'm gonna just talk a little bit about the swarm detection uh, that we do with temperature devices that actually um, detect the, the temperature peak without that having to send the data to the cloud. It's done at, at what's, what's called at the edge. And the temperature sensor itself generates the, the binary signal 
to say something is going on. We had the first generation of devices released in 2015. And then in 2019, we released the, the T2, which is a second generation de device with a much more powerful processor where we can do, do the front end logic uh, on, on the device itself. Firmware upgrade was released in 2020 and the uh, temperature event detection uh, can now change the logging interval of the device from the normally one, once per hour to once per minute. And with this, uh, we will get a much better resolution of the temperature peak uh, when it actually takes place. This change was based on a paper that was uh, published in 2016 in the Latvia, in, in, in Europe. And um, these <clears throat> beekeepers, they were describing this um, logic that during the warm-up stage about 10 to 20 minutes before take of a temperature uh, rise of 3 to 6 F from a typical range of 93 to 95 to 99 to 100 F was registered by a temperature sensor placed above the polyethylene foil covering the upper hive body under the pillow. Now this essentially means that they had a quilt box on top of the, of the hive and the uh, um, the temperature sensor was under the quilt box. And for us, this was the perfect uh, example or the perfect basis uh, to, to write the software and, and do the event detection. And so every event that is detected by such a sensor is, is then flagged automatically with this, this red T and we can immediately see what's going on. And if I look at the ray chart, uh, here we had the swarm, and then a couple of three days later, we had this temperature event. And if we look at the weight profile, we see that the weight uh, change is not permanent, but it's, it's actually temporary. Uh, the swarm left around 12, and they were back in the hive around 4 p.m. the same afternoon. And this is a clear indication that uh, most likely one of the virgins went out on a mating flight, a bunch of bees went with her and uh, they had, they did their thing and came back and she, she now came back as a, as a mated queen. And now going back to uh, the published paper from 2016, uh, these scientists had 10 hives, um, available to do their tests. They recorded nine swarms and with the data available, they did an incredible job uh, coming up with this, this algorithm. And we now have hundreds of hives out there with this logic and uh, we, we can uh, pretty much expand on this and, and, and really do a much better um, uh, job in even refining the algorithm uh, the scientists came up with. And we are in the process of analyzing the data we've collected over two seasons, season seasons now, 2020 and 2021. And uh, we will come up with um, an improved logic, which we get a lot of false positives and we will need to uh, weed those out and, and make the algorithm better. We invite everyone who has uh, uh, CS kits, uh, citizen science kits for, for group mind to participate um, and make the data available for analysis. Now, once we've uh, seen all this, we, I went back and looked at my hives and, and uh, checked what, what is uh, happening. Do I see similar uh, behaviors on, on, on my hives? And, and sure enough, I, I could look on, on a number of hives and I saw the same pattern over and over with two peaks, uh, one in the lower, one in the upper group box, I see a weight drop that is not permanent. Uh, in this case, that was a, a hive, which was before the one I've, I've shown earlier. Um, and that was the first swarm of the season. Uh, and which means this was a, not a mating flight. This was most likely a queen leaving the hive or a, a colony leaving the hive and they may have left the queen behind and came back because they didn't have the queen, uh, something like this. Um, there's another example, uh, same, uh, same behavior. 
And, you know, this makes me think that this is happening a lot more than we think. And you only see it when you really have instrumentation or you're, you're right there next to the hive. Otherwise, you will not be able to see what's, what's going on because it's a matter of, of two or three hours. And if you're not there at that time, you may never realize that something has happened. Here is another poll. Yes. Uh, we see, I've seen this regularly. I, this you is don't... not uncommon for me to see at all. Yeah, okay. Well, it, it, was, a, it was a surprise for me, but uh, it, it's, it's quite interesting that we have that many swarm returns, you know? Yeah, swarm ret return swarms are not, are, are nothing that I consider to be unusual. Yeah. Okay. Here is here is one which I witnessed. Um, <clears throat> I was out there, and, and because we have this temperature peak, uh, it sends us a, a text message. In this case, um, the swarm. I got a text message at, at uh, 19 minutes past one uh, that the swarm took place on this hive. I saw the swarm in a tree four minutes later. I went to the to the barn to get a ladder to climb up and, and with a bucket and everything. I was back in front of the hive at two o'clock and the, the, the swarm was no longer in the tree, but they were back in the hive. So it was really interesting. And I, I found a virgin in the hive. And later on, I, I think it, it was probably no longer a virgin. It was a mated queen uh, that just came back. But at the time when you do the inspection, a freshly mated queen still looks like a virgin because it takes a few days for, for her ovaries to develop and, and the abdomen to, to become much larger. So um, the, the other thing is there are, there are still some unexplained events. There is this temperature peak um, when we have to wait. Uh, Valley, what is going on here? We, we, we don't really know. Now, with all this going on, we, we were trying to see, um, we were hoping, I should say, we were hoping that uh, based on the paper, we should see the temperature peak 10 to 20 minutes prior to the swarm departing. And we see now over and over that this is not the case, that the temperature peak always seems to happen right at the time when the majority of the bees uh, leave the hive. And I truly think uh, that this is the, um, the consequence of an upset control system. The, the bees are trying to maintain a steady state temperature and all of a sudden half the colony leaves and that disrupts the control loop. And it takes them a while to get this under control. And in most cases, when, when the bees leave, ambient temperature is not at 95 degrees, it's colder. So they are actually heating the hive to 95 degrees to, to have it uh, in, the, in the stable uh, zone of, for, for, for brood. And so when the bees leave, uh, you still have heat the bees in the, in the comb and they may just heat too much and you get this temperature excursion until they realize, okay, we need to throttle back and, and get, get everything back uh, under control. So we started running the scales at um, five minute intervals in order to see if we, can, if we can detect something like this. And sure enough, there was some rumble starting two and a half hours prior to the swarm. Um, where the, the weight starts to oscillate a lot stronger than it would be uh, when it's a, a regular day. So that, there is an indication that two and a half hours before the swarm, something is, is going on. Um, these temperature peaks, like I said, it, are an excellent indicator of what's going on. Here's an example of a... Of a uh, a colony where we had temperature peaks five days in a row. We had temperature peaks twice before a swarm. We had a swarm with a temperature peak. We had maybe a, a minor and, a, and a, a little bit of a bigger after swarm two days later. So clearly swarming creates these peaks and they're an excellent indicator that something is going on. Now, Yo, just another uh, five minutes. 
and then we'll start the Q&A. Yep, sure. I'm almost done. Okay. With all those uh, swarms, the, it, it's always a sad thing when you see a swarm uh, leave a hive. I mean, that's not, it's not a good thing. When they come back, okay, good enough. If they leave permanently, then uh, it, it's not such a good thing. And I'm trapping swarms left and right every year. And I've, I've used uh, broodminder equipment uh, to help me with, with this trapping operation. And, and I just want to share uh, the way I set this up. I have these swarm boxes. Everybody is familiar with those, with the 40 liter uh, volume, according to uh, Tom Seeley's, uh, Seeley's book. And I put six frames in here. And these frames, do not, they have the top bar, they have the side bars, but they do not have a bottom bar in order to uh, give the bees the illusion that the box is empty. If you put frames in there with a bottom bar, the, the, the space looks too small for them and they tend not to go in. I have one bait frame that's fully drawn comb and I have a temperature sensor above this, this bait frame. And that's how I hang these uh, swarm traps on a tree and then wait until a swarm moves in. And what I want to see is, I want to see the drawn comb to about uh, the, the, the depth of a, of a deep frame. So this is a frame I put in there with the side bars, the top bar, but no bottom bar. And then when I, when I transfer the, um, the bees to a hive, I flip the frame upside down, lay it on, its, uh, on, on, the, on the top bar, so it's vertical, and then I glue in the bottom bar, hold it together with, with rubber bands and put, the, put the, um, the frame in a hive. So this is typically uh, about a week's uh, time be, be, between uh, the swarm moving in and me uh, transferring them to a hive. What I do not want is this, where a swarm is in the hive for much too long. They have capped brood. They have honey, and this was a frame without any comb at all. And in this case, the, uh, the swarm was in the box at the, at the neighbor's house uh, for about one month. And of course, then you, you have a mess because now I have to cut it here to put the bottom bar in, and I have to cut through brood, and I don't really want to do that. Now in this, and here comes the, um, the temperature sensor becomes very handy because uh, if I have no temperature delta between ambient, the, the dotted line, and the solid line, which is the temperature above that bait frame, if there is no temperature delta, uh, then I, I have nobody in there. And as soon as, as a colony moves in, I clearly see how you know the temperature is, is above ambient at all times. And I went ahead and I took the temperature difference, these vertical lines are midnight. So I take the temperature difference on the first night after the swarm moves in from, from ambient to the, um, the, the, the temperature above the bait frame. And this gives me a measure on how, how uh, big the colony is that moved in. And if I plot this, I have a temperature increase of 30 degrees. I know I have roughly a seven pound swarm in the box. And so this gives, uh, gives you uh, an excellent way, not only to know when a, when a um, colony moves in, but also uh, do I need to get a new credit or is it a full hive? How many bees do I have to, to deal with? Now, swarm boxes are typically on trees. I have them in, in pretty much every apiary uh, uh, on trees around the hives. And quite often they're further away than uh, what you can reach with a, um, with a standard broodminder device. So now here comes, comes the LoRa um, device, comes in very handy because uh, he, we, we can get a range of uh, close to a mile uh, with, a, with a $34 temperature sensor, and that will, will uh, connect to a hub that costs $24. And you can, you can with this hub, uh, you can get the, the data into my group minder uh, without anything else. So this is more 
economical than our solution with a temperature device and a sub hub, which is, uh, which is, which is quite expensive. And that's about uh, it, what I uh, wanted to share with you today. And um, here is a picture of our, of our team. And uh, with this, I would- I just uh, want to add that uh, this has been a terribly wonderful amount of fun. Uh, and our, our team's been great. We don't know what we're doing, which is just what we all live for. <laughs> and uh, you know, we're finding out a lot of cool stuff. So uh, yep. we're happy for anyone who joins in and, and we'll just keep going at it. Thanks for that. That was great. Brandy, the show's yours. <laughs> but you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how does uh, Wi-Fi, 4G, 5G frequencies affect the bees? And it, if does the Wi-Fi from your device uh, uh, affect the hive? It's not Wi-Fi, it's Bluetooth. Okay. Uh, so we have not seen any reports on, um, on the effect. Uh, we use Bluetooth low energy within the hive. And then outside of the hive, we have the higher transmitter powers, the cell pack, uh, packages and Wi-Fi packages. Okay. Uh, so we've seen no effect. We haven't read about it. Are you, are you near an airport effects. or away from an airport? <laughs> <laughs> A B okay. port. One thing we are dealing with a little bit is that all of the 4G stuff is disappearing at the end of 2022. So we've had to redesign. Um, it, you know, you're just constantly having to redesign stuff because the world changes under us. Right. Okay. Another question: uh, Using temperature and humidity data during the winter months, is it possible to determine if your hive is queen right or queenless? This guy has a broodminder uh, temperature humidity sensor and in two hives and says the temperature in the hives is usually around 58 degrees Fahrenheit, which seems a little low for me with, uh, during the winter. And the humidity is lower than ambient. So um, uh, he didn't see any brood or, or, or queens. So um, he's curious, oh, that's why it'd be so low. Just curious if while monitoring hives during the winter months, you've discovered trends that would indicate the queen status of a hive. It's very yeah. difficult in the winter time because the, the, uh, the bees are not maintaining um, the brutness temperature like they do in the summer or spring and summer. Right. So and the other thing that happens in the north is they are all clustering. And so if you have a cluster of bees here and your temperature sensors here, right. you're not going to see the cluster temperature very well. So typically in the north, we mount the temperature sensor up at the top, you know, just so that any heat, and basically we know it's warmer inside than outside, you got right. bees alone. You got bees in there. And actually that's why I started this whole thing was the first, you know, seven out of the first eight years I kept bees. Uh, when I went to open them in Wisconsin in March, I didn't know whether they died in December or, you know, two weeks before I opened them. So that's oh. about all you can reliably look at in the winter. When, 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 when have you determined moving. that they do die? What, what, what month do you typically see that? them die? What month uh, do they die? I, I, my, my personal experience is what they died all different months, depending okay. on whether the top blew off the hive or Okay. Cover okay. Or they starved or all the stupid things yeah. that. Uh, uh, the, get I get this question asked about starvation events. And in my operation, starvation never. Uh, we do know that the they, they starve in the spring when they start right. brooding up. Okay. That's, that's always been my answer. Okay. Here's uh, Peter, answer you <laughs> Yeah. Peter Critcher, I have about 10 hives with broodminder devices with both. So this is, this is a customer. So answer this one well. <laughs> Over the past year, I see that when the hives were strong, the temperature was stable. And it's and I was getting a lot of temperature events. It was almost every day. And I was seeing five to 20 events over some months. I am wondering if there's something going on here that I am doing wrong. Well, I don't know, it's the bees doing this. Uh, and, and how I have the probe set up or it has been fixed with the newer software update. You want to answer, Theo, or you want me? Okay, uh, I, I guess it's, it's um some multitude of answers because 
I mean, let, let me answer this. Yeah. Are, are the hives strong? If the hives are strong, the, you will not see temperature events that often. You will see temperature events uh, when, there is a, when there is something going on, like a, a queen emerging, a mating flight, a swarm. Uh, if the colonies are small, then they tend to, the temperature tends to fluctuate with ambient temperature and you get a lot of these uh, temperature events. Okay. So the question is, how strong are these hives? Well, okay. and the other um, thing I just want to remark is that when we introduce this into the field, we'd much rather have uh, false positives than missed true positives. So, uh, in fact, Anya McGurk has joined her team and we're starting to go through, like Kayla said, these two years of data to you know, tighten it up a little bit. We didn't want to miss anything. So, you know, when the temperature on a on a weak hive is moving around, then we do get some false triggers, which we think is better than missing it. Okay. So the Here, here's, a, here's a question. Here here's a question for myself then. Uh, Stabenthaler, who did the IR um, temperatures of the uh, bees, the heater bees in the hive, says in the uh, in the uh, outer uh, mantle during the only maybe 10% of the bees are actually heater bees inside about 15%. So if you had your probe inside and only 15% of the bees are acting as heater bees, I'm wondering whether it just if your probe is next to a heater bee and it tends to be heating for that minute, it might give an event. And then when it stops heating, that event might go away. It might just, be, could that just be caused by an individual bee heating? Um, the heater bees are not on top of the, of the frame though. They're on the comb. Okay. Um, and we have to so, send. So, so the question then is where this guy has his his, his probe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Here's another one. Sabrina Lenore asked, "How often is the temperature being checked with the T2 produced after 2020? Every minute or only when certain temperature ranges?" It's once an hour per, uh, standard, and it, it's once a minute in case an event is detected for. 90 minutes before to 90 minutes after the event. <clears throat> and to clarify that a little bit, it's checking the temperature every minute, but only storing it if there's something. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> it's still checking it every minute. It's just that if you right. keep one minute data for six months, it's a, it's a lot, lot of data. stupid data. Okay, Jim Littleton asked, will there be handouts from this? Jerry? Well, we don't normally give handouts, but we record all these sessions and they're Great. posted to the website. So you can go back to them and go take notes. Okay. Okay. The last question uh, from questions, is there a way the batteries for the scale can become separate from the scale or can you take them away from the scale and have them inside the hive to keep them warm? Even with lithium batteries, I find mine can die during extended cold temperatures up here in Northern British Columbia. Yeah, that's a tough thing. The, uh, the new scales, we've started using larger batteries. Um, we're using tiny batteries inside the hive because we only have a quarter inch to work with in bee space. But now on the new scales that we've been doing, we're now using uh, AAA and AA batteries. So they should work a lot better. Okay. Let me ask you a question myself, uh, Teo. Uh, when I was looking at your charts, it looked as though the temperature spike uh, occurred immediately at the time of the beginning of the weight loss, um, yes. which that would co correspond with Juliana Rangel's uh, work with uh, Tom Seeley of the 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 um, the bees, the scout bees, uh, uh, doing the running over the top of the cluster and getting the bees to suddenly heat up their flight muscles in preparation for flight. Okay, so that 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 exactly uh, corresponds with with Juliana Rangel's findings. Okay, uh, Sharon Figueroa says, can you talk a bit more about the audio sensors that you discussed earlier? Is it mainly sound volume or is any qualitative data captured? Another couple of minutes and then we'll jump to, uh, to Jerry's talk. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, so uh, if you look up, uh, you can see a paper by Herb, uh, Herb Aumann, A-U-M-E-N, I believe it is, um, University of Maine, and he's got a nice paper. It's uh, Janus Probe, as he calls it, J-A-N-U-S, which was the Roman god with two faces. But the audio that he ended up doing, and I, I think it's a good idea, is just really the volume. So it's 
uh, the approach was to put basically a guitar pickup against the hive box. So this is inside the hive. Uh, we know that there's, Jerry can talk about some of the complications uh -huh. of the microphones inside the hive, but uh, it's listening to the overall volume. So for instance, when Theo and I were at EAS, I was running in my apiary a test version of this, and we actually saw robbing happen, happening because uh, for four days in a row, we'd see about uh, two o'clock in the afternoon, the whole volume of the hive would start roaring. And so oh. it wasn't looking at the frequency response, but just the overall volume of it. And it, um, you know, it's going to tell us something. It's not as exotic as uh, the whole frequency discrimination, but uh, it'll be pretty damn cheap too, which Okay, uh, before Jerry starts, two quick questions. I can tell you both of them, and you can answer them then. One, it, uh, is there an ideal humidity in the hive during the winter? And two, if you have brood miners and bees that are sick with EFB or AFB, do the temperatures tell you anything? So first, well, is there an ideal humidity during the winter? Well, ideal humidity in the winter is below 100%. <laughs> we don't want it to rain in the hive. Okay. And well, what, what, what can you in cluster, what kind of humidity do you see? In cluster, what kind of humidity do you see during the winter? I can I can tell you what you see during the summer. What do you see during the winter? Well, Ian, you, you want to tell us what you've been seeing because you've been looking at this a lot. Between sixty and seventy. Okay, yeah. so a little uh, higher than than summer typically. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and then and the, the, the last humidity is pretty stable. Okay, are you can are you seeing? Can you detect European fabbrood or American fabbrood? We don't know. Okay, I don't know. We never had it, so I, I can't tell. <laughs> okay, well, let's let's move on to Jerry. Then there's a couple more you can you can go back and answer uh, later on. Just before we jump to Jerry, uh, no, Sima, you do get some some bumpy rides on the temperature, and then I was going to say for uh, summer for those fluctuating temperature sensors, uh, especially the top one, having an insulated top cover helps reduce that because the solar radiation really spikes the temperature. Mm -hmm. Add one more thing. Sure. Just I was using onset uh, data loggers for uh, temperature, but also with varroa mites, I could uh, see fluctuation in temperature for the brood uh, nest. Sounds good. Which, it, which was really kind of interesting. I can predict even the colony will die because the temperature starts going downhill and later on gone. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 